Corinthians, cha chapter 11. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 11, verses 17 through 34. I don't know, I just felt that I wanted us to focus on communion. And so, let's just start thinking already about communion. In fact, I'm calling this teaching the Lord's Table. So we're taking a break for a moment from the book of Colossians. Um, as I've been studying Colossians, I just give you, give you a little glimpse ahead, a little trailer. Uh, don't, mix the, don't miss the next three Sundays in a row. Life-changing. You get the next three Sundays, you'll understand life and you'll understand death. You get the next three Sundays in a row, and what you will have is what is necessary to have a vital Christian walk. And so I want to encourage you not to miss the next three Sundays. Let me start out by asking a question. Can anybody here remember the very first time you had communion? Is that any, anybody in that category? Okay. Well, I, I'm surprised there's so few. Well, is it because we like started having communion, some of us, when we were so young? Is that, the, is that it? Yes. Okay. You probably then remember, well, at least I do, the church that I was raised in, we had what was called First Holy Communion. How many of those we got here? Oh, look at all those. First Holy Communions. Great. Uh, it took place uh, for us, at, at least in our parish, uh, when the uh, child reached the age of seven years old. So I'm remembering seven years old and having communion for the first time. That was called the age of accountability. That's why we waited until age seven. The idea is that you could figure out what you were doing. Also, in that age of accountability or age of reason was the thinking that you could no longer be excused, so to speak, for being innocent of the sins that you committed. Or as I like to say, it was the age when you became an official sinner. I can clearly remember the rehearsals. Anybody remember those rehearsals? Well, we, we practiced long and hard before we had that first Holy Communion. Our class would line up. There'd be the line of boys next to the line of girls. Uh, also, we were... Uh, lined up by height. Anybody remember that? I don't know why I have such vivid memories of this. I think maybe I know why. Because the girl that was I was paired up with, her name was Jody, and she was cute. And after all, we were the same height. You know, that's important. <laughs> so I can remember getting all dressed up that morning. I can remember it was brand new clothes, wore a suit. I think I even had some of my dad's cologne on which would have been something like, uh, what would it have been? Uh, Old Spice. <laughs> I had some Old Spice on. That's right. High Karate came later. Does anyone remember that one? Okay. Had some of my dad's cologne. I can remember clearly the celebration of it all. It was like this, uh, almost like a spectacle, because all the parents were watching, and everybody was dressed up so nice. And, uh but unfortunately, as hard as I try, I cannot actually remember taking communion. I remember the spectacle of it all. And so for me, I think I missed something. I missed the real significance of it. Let me see if I can give you another illustration as to what we're heading into as we're trying to understand communion this morning. Um, my uh, granddaughter, the oldest, Kaylee, she uh, loves to sing. She just sings, just all the time. And, uh, uh, and, and you can hardly stop her. She's in a, a youth worship group. She is also in a, uh, an a choir. And, uh, but then I, and then I think to myself, there's a lot of singers in my family. And, I, and, and as I grew up, it was normal. Okay, this may not be your experience. This is my experience. Growing up, it was normal in my family for different people in the family just to break out singing. I don't know. It was like living in a musical. That's what it was like. I don't know if you've had that before, but I even have uh, great memories of, uh, I, I, as I was remembering back at communion, I was thinking back of my earliest thoughts. My earliest thoughts are great. I, I remember my mom would tuck me in at night. She'd stroke my hair, and she would sing songs to me. So it was very normal 
in my family just to break into songs. I remember the first, uh, Jeannie was talking about this just the other day. First song she was with me, we were at a Ralph store, and I just broke into a song that was on the thing, and she was like, who is this guy? I don't know. <laughs> you know? Thank God she married me anyway, you know? But uh, recently, Kaylee was able to get some uh, backstage passes uh, to a Christian uh, concert that she went to, and Oh, she was most excited about that, you know. And uh, I said, well, uh, I can't remember who it was. Maybe it was Scott Cunningham or somebody like that. And uh, so she was backstage, and I was like, well, what, what did he do? She goes, well, he was talking to people. <laughs> and uh, what else? Well, he was kind of sitting there. <laughs> but the whole idea of this kind of a backstage pass was you were not seeing the person in the spectacle, so to speak, of what they were there to do. You were seeing a very close personal glimpse of them that nobody else got to see. You were seeing a part of them that was just reserved for a very personal situation. Guess what? In a sense, and please don't uh, consider that what I'm saying would be in any way, you know, rude towards the Lord. You know I wouldn't do that. But in a sense, communion for the believer is like a backstage pass. It's not, a, it's not the spectacle, the, the grand, beautiful teachings of Christ, which are indeed glorious. It's not his, uh, his mission to bring the gospel to the people. Instead, it's you and it's him. Just the two of you. It's like being invited to dinner with Christ. You show up. It's him and it's you. That's the kind of flavor that it should have rather than this spectacle. And I'm here to tell you, it should have that flavor each and every time. Like we talked about last week, remember? Sometimes going to church becomes going through the motions. You need to double check your Christianity. Never should gathering together for the praise and worship of Christ be something about going through the motions just a routine, just a ritual. That also is not what communion is all about. Have you ever heard the word Eucharist? Sometimes communion is called Eucharist. Okay, that word Eucharist, what it means literally is the giving of thanks. So we're going to partake today of the giving of thanks, personally, <laughs> to Christ your Savior, and I hope he's your Savior, and if he's not or you're not sure, boy, this is a beautiful morning to give your life to Christ. You see, the early church got into this habit. We're talking about the first, second century church. They were in this habit. It became their custom, so to speak, to eat together. Acts chapter 2, verse 42 tells us, all the believers... So I guess that would kind of include us. We're believers today. All the believers devoted themselves. I wonder what it is this morning that you would consider that you are devoted to. What you're really devoted to. What you think about most. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. I like to call these things the four table legs upon which the church sits. Here's the four table legs upon which any church sits. All believers, number one, devoted to the apostles' teaching. That would be the Word of God. I'm surprised that the number of churches today call themselves Christian, full of believers, and yet they never open their Bibles. I don't get that at all. I just totally draw a blank. Makes no sense to me. Or you have a group of committed believers who don't systematically go through the whole Word of God. It breaks my heart that there are some believers you can talk to, and they've been believers for years, and if you ask them, really, have you ever read the Bible? Well, well parts of it. Well, most of it. Well, I've heard some of it. Did you know that all of the Word of God is inspired by the Holy Spirit? It's all God-breathed. 
Some people say, well, I'm not free in this area of my life, and I'm not free in that area of my life. Jesus said, you'll know the truth. What? And the truth will set you free. That was Jesus who said that. Well, where do I know that I'm absolutely getting pure truth all the time? The Word of God. <laughs> why would you... Why would you put, why would we put our nose, why would I put my nose any other place other than in the Word of God? So, the Apostles' teaching is the Bible. Number two is fellowship. I think we're pretty good at that around here. The unity of togetherness, getting involved in each other's life, not just on a superficial level, but I honest to goodness have this desire and devotion within me to see you succeed in your walk in Christ. That's fellowship. Not just about football games and that. Number three, sharing meals together. Well, we like that, don't we, around here? Sharing meals together in communion. Hey, what was that? That spaghetti, was that last week? Was that like out of this world? Okay, I kind of, I'll have to admit, you know, it says confess your sins one to another. I kind of swooped in there at the end and I took the leftovers home with me. <laughs> Oh, some of you didn't think that was so funny. Okay. <laughs> Sharing meals together, including communion. And number four, praying together. Praying together. We like that too, don't we? Keeping that lifeline open to God. It's like somebody, you know, is going through a hard time or a difficulty or not quite sure about their faith. And Hey, pray. God's right there. He wants to become involved in every single thing. Frustrated, angry. I had a brother tell me, man, I was just out on the road and I just started getting mad at everything and I don't know what was happening. And prayer is the answer. Prayer. So those are the four table legs. So what we're doing today is called the Eucharist. It's called the Lord's Supper. It's also called communion. There's another name for communion. I don't know if you're familiar with this or not. But the early church, again, I'll refer to them. The early church, they had a term, and the term was agape feast or love feast. And the way that that would work is the church would have a dinner or they'd have a potluck when they gathered together, and then they would reserve for the very end of the meal would turn into worship and into communion. That sound great? We usually do it the other way around here, don't we? First we have communion, and then we go eat. But unfortunately, the church at Corinth, what they had done was, okay, it's kind of shocking. They had allowed it to deteriorate into a feast without love. So we want to make sure that we're guarding against that this morning. A feast where who sat where mattered. Who was seen with who was important. What somebody was dressed and, 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 and the group that they hung with, that was important there in Corinth. We even see that there in Corinth, at the end, it actually deteriorated to the point where there were actually some drunkenness taking place at a love feast and partaking of communion. So what I want to start out with is I want to give us a sense of how the Apostle Paul dealt with a church that was doing communion wrong. I want us to get a real feel for it, an idea of what communion is not supposed to be, and then to see what it is supposed to be. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this morning. I already sense your presence here. And I know communion is a time when we are counting upon Thank you, Lord, and I praise you, and I pray these things in Jesus' wonderful name, and the whole church family says, Amen. please follow along as I read then, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 17 through 22 to get us started. Paul the Apostle writes, now in giving these instructions, instructions on communion, the Lord's table, I do not praise you since you come together not for the better but for the worse. 
that amazing? First of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And in part, I believe it. For there must also be factions among you that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Therefore, when you come together in one place, is it not to eat the Lord's Supper? For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others. And one is hungry, and another is drunk. What? Do you, t t take a look at that. What? See the exclamation after that? I mean, he's just like in shock. He just said these things. They're included in the word of God. You made communion, he's saying to the Corinthian church, something that was never intended to be. You're worse off for having done it. And then he goes, what? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? It almost looks like maybe their love feast, they were kind of taking care of the poor, doesn't it? And here are people that have their own homes and have refrigerators full of food jumping in line ahead of somebody who doesn't have anything and scarfing it all up. What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. It almost seems like they were praising themselves about their communion service. Hey, have you seen our communion service? Woo, man, what a party. It's awesome, man. And I got to sit right up front, and I got to sit with so-and-so, and did you see who came? And we invited the mayor, and he gave a speech, and man, the booze were flowing. What has that got to do with the Lord's Supper? So church family, be thankful that this is not us and never let it become us. To me, in these verses, the Apostle Paul is speaking to a group of Christians who have successfully removed Christ from communion. They weren't there to have communion. They were there to do other things. You may have not thought that was possible, but apparently it is possible. Making communion not what Christ meant it to be, something that was very close, something that was very personal. It's like Jesus said, I want to sit, I want to sit with you. I want to be with you right now. I want to talk about what's going on with you. You may think, you may have struggled this week, you may have thought that I was distant from you, but here, come, sit down. I'm going to sit right across from you. I'm going to look into your eyes. We're going to be intimate at this moment because I know everything there is to know about you. I'm going to lead us in this little journey through these verses, and we're going to end up in a place where I'm going to give us the opportunity both to recognize God, to examine who we are and where we are with the Lord at this moment precisely. And to get close and personal with Jesus Christ. Do you think, do you need that? Yeah. I need that. <laughs> I think the Lord led me into this and I was like, really Lord, I can do that? Just a whole service, communion and then communion? <laughs> yeah. Oh, good. Excellent. The Lord made the, that first communion service. He washed, he washed the feet of the disciples. Look, I don't know how you'd be in a group of people that you're looking at <laughs> and you're having dinner with, and yet you had a knowledge that in just moments they were going to leave you at your worst possible moment. I don't know what you would feel like in a group of people who were just about to turn their backs towards you, deny you. I don't know how you'd be, to, but I know how Jesus is. He got up and he washed their feet. I'll tell you, there's something special about communion. It goes way beyond crackers and punch. There's something very spiritual that happens each and every time you partake of communion. And I want you to be sure as a church family, I want to be sure 
that we have the right heart and attitude towards this each and every single time so that we're not missing something. We're getting all that Christ wants us to. We are not coming together for the worse, but we're coming together for the better. Here's a good thing to remember. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 24. It's kind of nice that it precedes this teaching. Paul the Apostle writes, Let no one seek his own. Which is interesting because we're living in an age would be, which could easily be categorized as an age where everybody only seeks their own. It's like being perpetually a teenager. Oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, for years with our uh, with our five kids, we I don't know what happened to that plaque we had hanging in the kitchen, but uh, kind of dis. I think one of the kids took it, but uh, it said, uh, uh, "Attention, teenagers, leave home now while you still know everything." <laughs> Paul the Apostle writes, Let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. Well, I tell you, that, that might be a spot for us to stop and consider, begin to examine ourselves even now. When was the last time I just sought for somebody else's well-being? You know, would that be a new experience? I hope not. Look at Jesus, the one you follow. Look how he seeks the well-being of others. Puts himself last. Uh, verse 23 of 1 Corinthians 11. Paul the Apostle then writes, For I receive from the Lord that which I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. That was the Passover, so it would have been unleavened bread, and leaven in the scriptures signifies sin. So he takes unleavened bread, that bread represents himself. Verse 24, and when he had given thanks, that's the Eucharist, and I want you to understand, he is giving thanks knowing full well that he's about to face the cross. Oh, I wonder if God can bring us to the place. Or when we know that we're heading into a trial or we're in the middle of a trial, we can give thanks. Not for the trial, but for the God who's with us in it. When he had given thanks, he broke it, signifying his own brokenness for us, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup. Don't you find it interesting that one portion it says he takes the bread. The next, verse 25 says, it says he didn't take the wine. It says he took the cup. Now, I, I want to point out to that because to take the cup had a significance that it meant I am accepting all that God has for me. I'm going to take the cup that God has for me. It's kind of like saying, Father, your will be done above mine. Your will and not mine. Will you, believer, accept the cup that God gives you? The life, the trials, the troubles, the things you face, will you accept the cup? Jesus says, Paul says, in the same manner he also took the cup after supper, saying, this is the cup, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. When he says that, that's the speaking of his death. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. I'm going to come back to that verse. Therefore, 
Whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. First, let's go back to verse 24. He says, Do this in remembrance of me. It's very key. In fact, aren't there some churches that you've been to where they... Have you seen that where they had the table in the back and then carved into the, the wood of the table is are those words? Do this in remembrance of me. Well, I think that's beautiful. I, I like that. Do this in remembrance of me. That is what Christ is asking us to do. These are the words of our Savior. They should be very near and dear to each one of us. Each one of us should be taking those words as a personal instruction from Jesus Christ to you. Paul, yes, Lord. I want you to, yes, Lord, do this in remembrance of me. In remembrance of what? His coming here, giving up his place in heaven, of his willingness to suffer in every way in which we suffer, tempted in every way in which we're tempted, yet without sin. That he faced such hostility from the world, who killed him but yet at our belief in christ his death upon the cross becomes our victory becomes our backstage pass if you will to suffer with christ personally for all eternity don't you find it interesting that jesus speaking to a church that had gone off the track he says look church i'm standing at the door <laughs> Imagine Jesus, ushers close the door because we're starting the service. And they're so pounding at the door. Shh, quiet, we've started the service. Who's out there? It's me, Jesus. He says, I stand at the door and knock. If you'll open the door, I'll come in and what? Sup with you. Do you find it interesting that he says that? Apparently it's important to Jesus to sit down and eat with us. I like that. <laughs> I like a good meal with people I love, especially the Lord Jesus Christ wants to be that personal with me. Lord, what are we doing today? I'm taking you to dinner. Right on, Lord. The Lord's Supper. Verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, which is what we're going to do, here's what it means. You proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. That's what you're doing. That's what we're about to do. We're about to proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It's crucial for the believer. It's crucial. Number one, Jesus died for our sins. Remember Paul the Apostle says, I'm going to preach the cross of Christ. Nothing else. I'm going to keep it simple. It's the cross. It's the cross. It's the cross. Sometimes the church gets involved in all kinds of other things. Well, we have, uh, we have various uh, Bible studies. We have uh, Bible studies uh, for those over 50. We have Bible studies of those under 50, but not yet 25. We have, uh, you know, groups for people that are redheads only can come to that particular Bible study. We have a knitting Bible study. We have a <laughs> all these different groups. We have a group that uh, is uh, whatever your particular ilk is, your bent, we'll have a group for that particular group. Look, let's preach the cross of Christ. That's what we all need. It's unity is what we need. Togetherness is what we need. It doesn't matter whether you're young or old doesn't matter what particular group you were, where you were raised, how you were raised, what part of the world you were born into. The world needs the cross of Jesus Christ. And when you partake of communion, it is speaking loud and clear. I believe in the message of Christ. I believe in the cross of Christ. I believe the work that Christ did. I accept the cup of salvation. That's beautiful, isn't it? We get to do that. And not only 
then, as we partake, are we speaking of Christ's death, but we're also speaking of his imminent return. I'm going to tell you when Christ is going to return. You want me to tell you what he said? Anytime. <laughs> That's when he's going to return. Anytime. Anytime now. Could be morning. Could be afternoon. Could be dinner. Could be when you tuck your little head in bed. He can come back at any time. Now that might comfort you, which is what it should do. Or it might make you a little uncomfortable. And that tells you that you need to examine your heart before you partake of communion. But that's what we're talking about. Now, I want to unpack this word remembrance. And I see I'm running out of time. But I want to unpack that word remembrance very quickly. Because it's a different word than just remember. He's not just saying remember me he says do this in remembrance of me remembrance is an activity remember seems to be a well you know remember is just remembering a fact all right when did columbus sail the ocean blue 1492 right on right we remember that one, don't we okay, that's just remembering a fact but remembrance is something different especially to the hebrew mind it meant to reach back to an event and to pull it right into the present. To make a past reality something that is current and no longer past because I'm just involved, I'm breathing it in. I am actively, consciously considering the presence of Christ right now. His working in my life right now. And also the fact that he could return at any time. It means to ponder the significance of that event of the cross in my own life presently. Here's what I wrote out. In communion, it is like Jesus saying to you, do this, and when you do it, think of me. Recall me now to your heart and mind. And along with my dying for you, recall my resurrection and that I ever live to make intercession for you. Consider now your name on my lips before the Father and that right now. Use this time to judge the significance of my return and of our meeting finally face to face. I want you to get ready because I am coming for you. Involve your thoughts on these heavenly manners, matters. I want you to do this in remembrance of me. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2 says looking unto Jesus the author and the finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross look it's also appropriate appropriate to have joy in communion to have real joy Psalm 32 verse 1 blessed happy is he whose transgression is forgiven. At salvation, at the moment of faith in Christ, the cross became your salvation. Well, I'm happy to look back on that, aren't you? The scripture says we love him because we, he first loved us. And this partaking of communion is a remembering of the Christ's love for us remembering of his giving his life for us jesus there thinking of you verse 28 because there's a warning that goes along with communion we would be wise to pay attention to it verse 28 but let a man examine himself and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup 
For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. You know, you, you made it of something else. You turned it into something else. It's no longer about Christ. Verse 30, For this reason many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. That means have died. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. In other words, take care of business before you go see the judge so that you don't have to worry about being judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened, that's the Lord taking you to the woodshed by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. In other words, if you're partaking of communion in an unworthy manner, expect to be corrected. Expect it. You make communion into something that it's not, expect that your Heavenly Father is going to take you to the woodshed. Verse 33, Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. Be kind. Consider other people ahead of yourselves in that love feast. But if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, lest you, lest you come together for judgment. And the rest I will set in order when I come. Some of us might think, I, I believe at this point, well, look, uh, if I eat and take the cup in an unworthy manner, I mean, how long do we have to think before we decide we're unworthy in comparison to Christ? You know, would that be like a nanosecond? I mean, where is the person who could not say, I don't deserve Christ becoming a man and dying in my place. I don't deserve a free and bold access to the throne room of heaven with my prayers. I don't deserve eternal life. But God's forgiveness is not based on our worthiness, is it? Otherwise, I'd be telling at you, work harder. You need to work harder. <laughs> be more holy. Will you please be more holy? <laughs> Go be more holy so that God can save you. Well, that's not the gospel. The gospel is the person who recognized there's no salvation apart from Christ. I can't save myself. You, when you recognize that, you have now joined the condition, the true condition of all humanity. We need a Savior. The people who are not saved are the people who think somehow that they're good enough to enter heaven. There aren't any. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 5 through 7, New Living Translation. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. That's the way you get to the Father. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. This is New Living Translation. Verse 6. So we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear Son. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. If you can grasp verse 7, you can grasp heaven. If you can grasp verse 7, you have forgiveness of sins. If you're drawing a blank or you don't want verse 7, you don't have eternal life according to Jesus Christ. Let me read it again. God is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. That's the gospel. It's Christ who makes a person free. It's Christ who makes a person holy. It's Christ who makes a person acceptable before the Father. Communion is a loving, affectionate, 
focus upon the finished work of Christ on the cross, and it is a looking forward to his return. Please open to uh, Psalm 139, and we'll close here. Psalm 139, David, a favorite of so many. A man who loved the Lord but had feet of clay, didn't he? Somebody that we can all relate to. David wrote, I'm going to read the first 12 verses here. O Lord, you have examined my heart. Make this your prayer. And know everything about me. You know when I sit down or stand up. You know my thoughts even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I'm going to say even before I say it, Lord. You go before me and follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too great for me to understand. Verse 7. I can never escape from your presence. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell in the furthest ocean, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night, but even in the darkness I cannot hide from you. To you the night shines as bright as day. Darkness and light are the same to you. Drop down to verse 23. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out everything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. Let's continue praying right now. Worship band, come on up here. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this morning and the opportunity to focus our thoughts and our hearts and our attentions upon sitting across the table from you at this moment. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for even inviting us to your table. Thank you for knocking upon the door of our hearts and asking to come in, that you might have this time of communion with us, that you might live with us and sup with us. Lord God, maker of heaven and earth, each one in our hearts right now, as the Holy Spirit touches and leads you, confess to the Lord your belief in him you believe in Christ then tell him right now I believe in you I believe in you my savior you Jesus are my Lord you Jesus died for my sins yes you can come in and sup with me yes have your life with me Lord I've learned this morning that what I'm going to do right now as I partake of communion is I'm going to proclaim your death, which is my victory, which is the payment of my sins. And I am celebrating the Eucharist. I am being thankful. And I am also proclaiming the fact that you are coming back for me. Just tell the Lord, thank you for coming back for me. Thank you that you're going to come get me. Thank you that you're not going to leave me here. Thank you that I won't be judged like the world. Thank you that I don't have to suffer eternity apart from you. Thank you that heaven is mine on account of Christ. Thank you, Lord, I'll ever be thankful. I love you, Lord. I pray these things in Jesus' wonderful name. Let's worship. Ushers, why don't you come on forward?
the night that Jesus was betrayed, he lifted up the bread and he gave thanks. The bread that we use is unleavened bread because Jesus takes away our sin. The bread that we use is perforated, speaking of the nail scars and the piercing in his side. The bread that we use is striped because it speaks of the cat of nine tails that was used upon his back, all in payment of our sins. He who knew no sin, the scripture says, became sin. Lord Jesus, thank you that actually your body becomes our entrance into heaven. Thank you that you're the curtain that was torn in half in the temple by which we gain access to the Father. Lord Jesus, forgive us of our sin. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And as we partake, may we truly be doing it, knowing you are with us right now, Lord. In remembrance, we partake in Jesus' name. Stamp that little wafer in half and you may partake. And Jesus lifted up the cup. He said, here's the new covenant and the payment of your sins. Lord Jesus, thank you for taking the cup for us. The cup of the Father's wrath that was reserved for us and the payment of our sins upon ourselves which we could never accomplish given all eternity to suffer for them. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you took that cup for us. And now, Lord God, we accept the cup, acceptance and belief in what you did, and also taking the cup of the life and your will for us in our day and in our time now. And Lord Jesus, thank you that you plan on having communion with us when you return. And we finally see you face to face. It's coming very shortly. Thank you, Lord Jesus. May your blood be upon us, upon our homes and our children. We pray these things in Jesus' name you may partake. Lord, may this be healing for us and a setting right of our lives before you. May it be power for us to live a life in response to your goodness towards us. We love you, Lord, because you first loved us. It's all rise.